Citizens of the Reject Nation, welcome to another Koi's Comic Corner today. It's a big one. This is not an easy one. This took years of thought and a lot of stress this week for me to curate this. We're going to break down the top 25 comic book movies crossing genres, crossing studios. I'm wearing a Saga shirt because they don't make Saga movies yet, so it's non-denominational. This shirt is Switzerland. Now, please, if you like this video, do leave a like. That's how I know you like it. It literally helps me know this was worth doing. Also, please subscribe again. That's so Greg knows that you liked it and it's worth me being here. There's a series of ways to let us know you are liking this content. My favorite of which is leaving a comment. When you leave a comment, I get to know what you want to see more of. You're the co-host of this whole journey. You tell me what you want to see more of. Hint, hint, 26 through 50, 50 through 75, top 100. Let Greg know, I want to do this longer. 25 was a negotiation. Let's get to 50 minimum. Hear Greg laughing nervously because it's coming. And before we get into it, I want to thank everyone who's been following me on TikTok. Those 30 second, 15 second, minute long, three minute videos like this. You guys are saying you're coming over from Reject Nation. It means the world to see you guys jump from here and there and cross discuss. Anyway, let's get into it. Number 25. Let's start it spicy, you lovelies. My number 25 favorite comic book movie is Zack Snyder's The Snyder Cut of Justice League. This film, I think, captured the greatest parts of the Snyder experience. The visuals are lush. The world is built out. It is scopetastic. It is such an enormous undertaking in a very positive way. In creating it, in experiencing it, it is an hours and hours long experience that feels both like a movie and like a miniseries. It's the greatest of both. And I love that it really differentiates itself from Marvel movies, from other DC movies, from indie comic movies. It feels like Snyder's vision of these demigods, of these deities of this world. And you get his specific take on each one of these characters in a grand scale that also doesn't feel like it sacrifices these characters in the medium of comic books. It feels true to the comic, true to his vision, and all of it feels enormous like really no other comic book movie gets to because of the size of this project. Love me some Snyder Cut. Number 24, a movie that is foundational to comic book movies being what they are today. Now, this list is off of my favorites. I am keeping in mind what they did for the journey as well as what I rewatch often and what I think objectively now in 2022 is a good movie. So certain movies that I don't think held up or don't revisit or don't watch as often, they don't make the cut just because they were first. But this movie I think was very early on and does hold up and is very important. So it hits all those very important marks. It's Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 is one of the best of that era's villains. And then that villain coming back meant the world because we got so much time to dive into Alfred Molina's Doc Ock. It gave us a very important mixed melancholy with humor, with, you know, comic book Silver Age flavor Spider-Man through Sam Raimi's vision. And it gave us a more leveled out Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. You guys know, if you ever want to see me break down the three Spider-Man videos, leave that comment because Spider-Man, as far as I see him, Tobey Maguire is pretty far from how I personally call I perceive Spider-Man. So it's hard for me when I don't perceive Spider-Man that way to really adjust into this world. But the way Sam Raimi and Toby work together, the world they built really sings best in Spider-Man 2. Number 23 is much more recent and much more bombastic in both blood, gore, and glory. It is The Suicide Squad. James Gunn's The Suicide Squad is, I think, what you get when you let an insane comic book property, an insane director, and an insane budget go hog wild. And I think that's what comic movies can be. Comic books are about your imagination. The space between the panels is what you're experiencing in the story. When a director with the vision of James Gunn gets characters that aren't as beholden to continuity, you get things like a peacemaker show. You get things like characters that talk to rats as your big lead. You get Polka Dot Man as one of the favorite characters of the modern superhero era played masterfully by David Dasmalchen because that world fits so uniquely. You get Idris Elba's bloodshot in a way that you could only get in a movie this insane, this R-rated. This movie doesn't just represent the Suicide Squad to me. This movie represents full, creative, artistic freedom for the medium of comic book movies with someone well-deserving to go hog wild. Love the Suicide Squad. Number 22 is probably gonna get me a little bit of sass, but I'm ready for it. I got the shoulders, let's get after it. Iron Man 3 is, in my opinion, the maturation of the MCU. This is a movie that looks at the psychology of going through trauma. This is a movie that takes 
the most charming, cool, awesome guy in the MCU and puts him through the ringer because he has PTSD of seeing something that would shock you. We're looking at these characters that are going through larger than life situations and we're just watching them soldier on for a little bit. We're getting through phase one, we're building to something. But if you're gonna feel something, if you want to mature a universe, if you want to see the shell shock, if you wanna see the ramifications of these actions, you need movies like Iron Man 3. And this movie is so well handled with Shane Black working with Downey Jr. again after Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And he's making this universe for adults as well as entertaining kids. The Barrel of Monkeys airplane scene is still one of the best action sequences in the MCU, but you've also got a great world building with Don Cheadle and Downey Jr. You've also got a great extremist storyline. There are some flaws. I do not love the Killian fire breathing. I don't love that they changed out the villain, but those flaws are far outweighed by the excellence that is the tone shift of the entire MCU that doesn't get enough credit. This movie is exceptional. 21 is an incredible incredible adaptation of an incredible two issue comic book art. Days of Future Past is literally only two issues and they're two of the most important issues in the history of comic books. This movie is an Avengers level event. This movie has time travel. This movie has the culmination of the Singer X-Men movies to date. And I really honestly think it blends the best of Matt Vaughn's incredible X-Men First Class, which almost made this list with the best of Brian Singer's universe. If you think about that, when they made it, they literally made an Avengers level movie at Fox, trusting in their X-Men universe, trusting in us, the audience, trusting in their incredible cast. And you've got McAvoy opposite Patrick Stewart, both of Xavier. That's insane to think about from X-Men in 2000 to 20, I think it was like 16, they were able to get us to be able to enjoy that world. It does have some flaws. Don't love the McAvoy heroin storyline. Don't love the fact that they use a Wolverine instead of Shadow Cat. Those two things are taken out. This would be in the top 10 for me. This movie is a solid A. It is so close and it is clearly my number 21 with bells on. We're into the top 20. My number 20 is Wonder Woman. This movie does an impeccable job introducing us to an entire world. This takes the world of Themyscira and makes it real. The boat scene between Gal Gadot and Chris Pine is some of the most charming acting I've ever seen, much less in building a relationship in a comic book movie. The way they handle No Man's Land, the way they show the strength and femininity in action, the way they show the power of Diana Prince, the way they do all of this while also building out a great supporting cast, while also building out a World War I story that puts her in our universe, establishes a fun continuity, and is a great launching point. Unfortunately, it didn't launch into as good of a sequel, but what it did do was finalize how important Wonder Woman is and gave a hero for little girls and little boys and adult boys and adult girls the world over. This is a very important movie that had to stick the landing and did. There are some issues with the third act. Again, if this movie didn't have some of those third act issues, it'd be even higher. But since I do struggle with that last boss fight, I have to, to knock it down a few pegs, but it's still a top 20 for me favorite comic book film. Number 19, staying within the DC extended universe, we've got my personal favorite DCEU film, Shazam. To me, superhero films are about power and responsibility. To me, they're about staying young and what you believe in when you're a kid and not losing that sense of innocence and staying childlike without being childish. Some comic book movies are childish. This movie is childlike to a T. I'm also a sucker for an orphan story. I think family is so important. I think that the way you connect with family is so important. This movie did the opposite of the usual Hollywood foster shaming. This is about how family isn't blood, it's who welcomes you. It's also at moments very scary. It balances an 80s Amblin-esque tone. I love the villain in Mark Strong. I love the supernatural elements. I love that it's a great launching point and it gives us arguably as good of casting as your Downey Juniors and your Ryan Reynolds. I don't think Zach Levi gets enough credit for being a pitch perfect Shazam. In lesser hands, this movie doesn't work, but because Zach Levi is that inner child day in and day out and is a king of Comic-Con nerddom, he gets this movie and David F. Sandberg directing him makes it sing, throw in some Jack Dylan Grazer, Shazam. Number 18 is the movie that I think allowed for the greater MCU. I give Spider-Man a lot of credit. I give X-Men movies a lot of credit, but I think the movie 
that was sneakily a comic book movie that people just thought was a bitchin' vampire movie. Number 18 is Blade. This movie is so memorable. This movie is seared into your brain if you've ever seen it. The opening nightclub scene is, I think, still the greatest opening scene to any comic book movie. It gives you a tone. It gives you a badass lead. It establishes the villain. It lets you know the ride you're going to go on. The soundtrack to this movie is a banger. This movie feels cool because Blade is cool. It builds out an entire universe remarkably quickly. It allows you to feel like you're in this world and it predates the Matrix. It's got so much of that flair, that trench coat awesomeness that the 90s were defined by, but it did it first and it did it with a character that's from a comic book that a lot of people didn't even realize at the time. This movie doing well and New Line doing well allowed for the MCU to really get a launching point and I think honestly Mahershala Ali is the only person that could possibly keep up with what Wesley Snipes did because Wesley Snipes is Blade, and this movie is so important. Number 17 is, I think, one of the most loyal adaptations to the feel of a character while still being true to its medium and still being true to the things that came before it. That is Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Not only does this give us my personal favorite journey with Kevin Conroy's Batman to date, some incredible Mark Hamill Joker, but it also gives us a new villain. I love the Phantasm villain who only just came back in the comic books in this great Tom King realm, which I definitely recommend, but it's also a story that is unique to this arc, but also resonates with so many classic archetypal Batman stories. It is a very summer, it's now that's what I call Batman. You cannot know Batman and throw in Mask of the Phantasm and you get the character much more than the average movie. This movie is, I think, the definition of Batman, and I think the live action movies have been chasing it largely ever since. You throw in a really fun twist that actually totally resonates, and an incredible pace that works for adults and kids alike. Batman Mask of the Phantasm is the bar in animated or live action comic book film. Number 16 is the first time I remember sitting in a movie theater and going, I don't have any like nerd notes. Like I, you know, obviously always have little qualms and things, but with Spider-Man, I had my moments, my Toby issues. With X-Men 1, I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. X2, I think really was, was one to nail it. Whereas Blade doesn't have a strong continuity, right? Like Blade, the runs of the comic books never really establish a singular narrative, which is why it's a beautifully freeing character. X-Men is the opposite. X-Men has tons of messy continuity that's always fighting each other. X-Men is a giant soap opera. It's very easy to get wrong. X-Men 2 captured the world that hates and fears them. It adapted very lovingly. God loves man kills. It gave us a taste of Berserker Rage as hard as you could have gone in a PG-13 rating. Basically, it learned everything it could have from X-Men 1, evolved, improved, and gave us a sequel that not enough people give credit as one of the great sequels. This movie is the reason we continued on with comic book movies going well. Blade might have kicked the door open, but this lovingly took off running. X-Men 2, still exceptional. Number 15 is a comic book splash page come to life. Captain America's Civil War. So many people come at me with like, that's overrated, doesn't hold up. This is a movie that into building the MCU gives us hero versus hero with reliable reasons. Iron Man has justification for his actions and builds on the character we've lived with for a years, for a years, for a long time. Captain America, very justified in his actions. He is living up to all the standards we've established with Chris Evans as Captain America. Their conflict is justified and that they were friends makes it beautifully well orchestrated by Baron Zemo, masterfully played by Daniel Brühl, who also, by the way, took out T'Chaka. Opening the film, bringing us in one of the most incredible introductions of not just Black Panther, but Spider-Man, while weaving an incredible web of action, intrigue, espionage, and launching into where we go with Infinity War and Endgame in the giant tapestry of phase one through three the x through the center is civil war and you got to put respect on its name and not enough people do 15 civil war fucking slaps number 14 is one of the most important comic book movies ever made it is a film that started to truly legitimize genre content this was a movie nominated for best picture by the academy awards this is a movie that made so much over a billion dollars this is a movie that i personally saw four times in theaters because i kept wanting to discover more this movie has a perfect soundtrack this movie has a perfect cast this movie has a perfect villain this movie has a perfect protagonist this movie is black panther if 
you watch Black Panther, you notice that not only does the entire ensemble cast have their own individual beautiful subplots, not only does Chadwick masterfully navigate being T'Challa as a regal king intellectualizing everything while watching from the background while never becoming the background, he's able to be equal parts Jason Bourne, James Bond, and the talented Mr. Ripley. He is watching, he is calculated, he is navigating. All of this set to a giant summer spectacle blockbuster with Ludwig Göransson making the music alongside Kendrick Lamar. This movie, some of its parts should not be able to be the 11 you'd expect because it's a fucking 12. This movie is an A+. This movie made the Marvel Universe into the force of nature that it is, and this movie means so much to so many people, so it had some of the highest expectations and absolutely nailed them. Black Panther is one of the greats in comic book movies. A movie is as good as its villain, and our number 13 has an incredible villain because we lived with him for quite some time. Avengers Endgame has to answer, how do you take out Thanos? And the beautiful thing about Avengers Endgame is our heroes have lost. This is something that is the comeback from Empire. This is something that is how you solve trauma and it sets up phase four's entire therapy session where everything is trauma. This movie is brutal and it shows that even heroes have to think outside the box that everything isn't cookie cutter. This solves the, oh, the heroes will figure the thing out. They have to go through time travel. They have to find out new logistics. They have to team up in new and creative ways. And it gives us so many incredible genre redefining moments in comic book lore when cap wields mjolnir when thor comes back when they blend the incredible different tapestries of the guardians of the galaxy tonality with thor's tonality with cap's tonality with iron man's tonality it does all of that while also giving amazing performances in losing iron man in seeing heroes fall we truly feel the ability of loss in this genre and this movie again establishes that trauma is something that happens not just to the heroes on screen but to us who love them this movie proves that heroes can fall and it's a very important one number 12 i love this movie and i feel like it's sequel which you'll note i haven't talked about it yet because i do enjoy it a little bit more are foundational to the maturation again of the genre when you look at 2006, it was a weird time in comic book movies, and a great example is this movie had Nickelback scoring it, and it was advertised as a Katie Holmes rom-com. You're right, Batman Begins. Look at the first Batman Begins trailer. We were so not sure what comic book movies were because we were fresh off of the craziness of Fox, not knowing what they were going to land on, leading into 2008, giving us Iron Man, that this was a Batman Begins that literally was like, Katie Holmes will save you from Dawson's Creek. They then came out and showed us what a year one Bruce Wayne could be in the right hands. It showed us that Nolan had this masterful broad strokes world of Gotham. It gave us a chilling scarecrow. It gave us an incredible Ra's al Ghul with all those twists and turns. And it gave us a Batman that yes, had some flaws. I don't love the voice all the time, but I do love that he struck fear in criminals. That when we felt Gotham, it didn't feel like something we could visit because we wouldn't want to go there. It felt like the Gotham of the comic books and not just Bruce Wayne or Batman. We finally got a Batman that was Bruce Wayne and Batman. And Batman Begins still holds up. Number 11 is a Western. Number 11 is an R-rated movie with a character we'd wanted to be R-rated for a decade after being with him. Number 11 is the swan song of one of the best comic book movie castings ever. Number 11 is Logan. Logan is a movie that used Johnny Cash's hurt throughout its marketing, and that's because this movie was Hurt. Now, famously, Trent Reznor said once Johnny Cash made Hurt, it wasn't his song anymore. To me, this is the movie example of seeing Logan as not the X-Men's Logan anymore. This was now Hugh Jackman's character in this universe, and that needed to be the end of his journey. I was apprehensive to have Charles come back in Doctor Strange because the ending of Logan is the ending of that entire character set. Luckily, it was a multiverse, and it didn't really feel like anything anyway. But this, to me is the culmination, much like Endgame, that finished off the Fox universe. A universe that gave us the first shared experience we really had in comic book movies. This movie had to be good, because if it didn't land, it would have felt like it sullied the entire journey first. This was an R-rated Western 
310 to Yuma-esque journey that we earned through wanting this character to get this closure. And it is so close to perfect. I don't love the comic books being in it. Short of that, this movie is, is absolutely perfect. And I love both what it says, how it's portrayed, and the experience of watching it. Top 10, you lovelies, Avengers Infinity War. I was dancing around Thanos talking about Endgame, but I think the reason Infinity War does such a good job at blending the insane world Marvel has built is because it takes away those characters as your lead and it makes your lead the guy that's been behind the scenes the whole time. This movie was like, hey, what if Palpatine was the, was the lead? What if our bad guy was the lead of this film? And then it's able to blend all of the different flavors of the MCU. One of the strengths of the MCU is that Ant-Man is a heist film, doesn't feel like a space opera. Guardians doesn't feel like tech wizardry. Iron Man doesn't feel like a proud patriot rooting for the greater good cap. They all feel different. How do you put them together post Age of Ultron? How do you combine all those things? One of the reasons Age of Ultron didn't quite work is the disparity of those tones. This showed you can do that right, and it focused on, for my money, one of the greatest cinematic villains of all time. The Thanos was right movement had movement. There are people that can see where he's coming from because if you sit on the 405 in LA at rush hour, you consider those thoughts. And the thing about Thanos is he wasn't mustache twirling. He just wanted to do what would save the universe. His goal was to save. Unfortunately, the cost of that was all of us losing half of everything. And Thanos wins. This movie ends with the Empire Strikes Back of Downers, and that's why Endgame had to come back from that. But for me, the beats in this movie, the landing of so many action set pieces, and the ability to convey the MCU is like nothing else we've ever seen in cinema before. Infinity War was the moment that I felt like they made that in ink. This was saying the MCU was like nothing that's come before and might not ever come again. This movie is a masterpiece of what comic books can be. Number nine, The Batman. I am ready for your recency bias comments. I am ready for your it was boring. I am ready for whatever is going to come at me because this is my experience and what I got to see three times in four days because I fell madly in love with this film is the Batman I've always wanted. I love Christian Bale's Batman. I love what they were able to do at times with Michael Keaton's Batman. I love Mask of the Phantasm, but I never felt like I got a live action detective mystery set in what I thought Gotham would smell like. This movie has such an atmosphere, you can smell it. This movie, to me, is also the closest we'll ever get to David Fincher making a comic book movie, who's my favorite director, and Matt Reeves made a love letter to that style of film. This movie is dark, it is grungy, and most of all, it is modern. I love that the sensibilities aren't playing off the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age. This is a Batman now. That's why Nirvana works. This is someone that's our age. This is modernizing a character that's archetypal, bringing you all of the texture and tone you need, and making it about today. If Batman was around today, he would deal with things like Riddler's Trolls. We, as a society, are dealing with things like terrorism through cyber attacks and people coming together for all the wrong reasons and the way batman stays relevant is he's one man fighting insurmountable odds and one good man can be enough and this is a man that goes from being i am vengeance to being i am hope and that's the difference between this batman and other batman batman is often a brute punching force he is a thing that i don't think uses guns but he uses aggressive violence to strike fear this batman learned before our eyes that fear doesn't mean anything if you also don't inspire hope that's what makes you a hero, and this is masterfully painted, and this movie couldn't have come at a time we needed a hero more, The Batman. Number eight, a movie that defied what movies had been. There's a long, long history of cinema. Movies have been around a long time. You know what hasn't been around a long time? Giant team-up spectacle summer blockbusters, because it just seems like a thing you don't do, and this movie made it so Expendables exists. It accelerated the Fast and the Furious journey. It is Joss Whedon's original Avengers. Now, I know some people don't love the dialogue, but as a comic book fan, I think that some of this dialogue is the most accurate to these characters. And yes, some things don't work because of when it came out, but it started everything. There was no blueprint. This is the blueprint. There was no history of how to do this. This was doing this. And I talked a lot about balancing tones in Infinity War and Endgame. This one had to do it first, and it had to do it so early. This was only four years into the MCU. Now, we live in a time where you get four comic book movies a year. This was a time you were lucky to get one, and it did it four years in? That's insane. They didn't know where the MCU was going to go, and they went, okay, we're going to make uh, movie number seven. That's going to be Avengers. Okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. And it worked 
and it landed and it gave us a great villain in Loki. It gave us something to unite and fight against. It gave us New York as a character like New York often is in the comics. It gave us that incredible turning shot that at this point is the Matrix bullet time of comic book movies that everyone tries to replicate because that is what it feel like what it, what it feels like when you see your heroes unite. I think Avengers with time will find its way back into the Zeitgeist again and it is the first to do something that needed to be done for any of this to exist. Number 7 is perhaps the most important comic book movie because it is a movie that shows the punk rock for lack of a better term attitude of marvel that got them to be where they are now if you look at comic books marvel often represents the underdog story you got your spider-man you got your you know steve rogers you got all these scrappy characters that overcome the odds that's what marvel is Iron Man was a movie made from scraps in a cave, just like the character did. Iron Man was a fresh, out of rehab, young man trying to put his life together that had the bravado of 10 kings, that had the acting prowess of winning an Oscar for Chaplin in his teens. This movie is an impossibility. This is a director who had done a bunch of incredible indies that was about to change the world in multiple different genres. This is a movie that had to be financed through multiple, like a distributor and a different person supplying the money up front. Like this movie was a series of pieces that wasn't finished when they started filming. This movie was being written as they went and it gives you what laid the framework. It is a hero fighting against his id and ego. It is a, it's Iron Man fighting Ironmonger. It's what he could have been. And it's someone learning that just because that's what he's been doing, it doesn't mean that's what he should be doing. And it's a C-list character that Stanley invented to be unlikable, that was cast as one of the most likable people ever, that is so good at playing unlikable. This is a perfect should not work and did work. And without Iron Man in 08, this list wouldn't exist. Now, this is one that is this high up because of rewatchability. Iron Man is hella rewatchable, and I often do, and it is how we got here, but I think that Guardians is the one that steered everything left. I don't think we would have gone cosmic if James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy didn't land like it did. I don't think the MCU would have accelerated to the amount of content it puts out without Guardians of the Galaxy, and this was the first movie I doubted in the MCU. I love the MCU. I've worked at this since phase one. I'm one of the few in this space that remembers waiting years between movies because it is a younger genre of people that do commentary in these movies. But why in my day, it was a different world. And I will admit, I was all about everything they announced. And when they announced the Guardians of the Galaxy, it was soon after the Disney thing. And I had just been listening to all of the hate on the internet. The internet's contagious. Sometimes trolling gets even to me and I try to be positive. And I was like, wait a second, they're gonna do that obscure C-list series of heroes with a talking tree and a raccoon and they're casting. And I literally thought it was a toy grab. I will admit that for only about a month, but there was about a month, I thought this was like, okay, they need to make this something to profit from with toys like Lucasfilm. And then this movie came out and it might be the biggest heart in the MCU. This might be the biggest beating heart of what it means to be an outsider, what it means to be a loser, what it means to feel like you're not someone that belongs. And if there's anything that the Marvel Universe does well, it's make outsiders feel like they belong. If you go to any con, you go to any fan screening, everyone that doesn't feel like they have a family has a family in the MCU. And the Guardians of the Galaxy showed us that on screen in space. Top five, we are into the top five and we're kicking it off with the Merc with the Mouth. This movie was tiny, shouldn't have existed, got leaked and exists out of sheer force of nerd will. Ryan Reynolds was born to play Deadpool. It just took him a long time to find the suit. He came out as Deadpool. Wade Reynolds is his name. <laughs> Wade Wilson is the person that Ryan Rodney Reynolds is just without the suit. And what this movie did was it showed us why we waited. The technology had to catch up. The budget had to be just right. And this movie was so good at being nimble. This movie was so good, again, at punk rock sensibilities that they cut an entire chunk of the budget because they were like, oh no, that's allocated for PR. That's not your money to use. And the scene in the film where he leaves his guns in the car is literally them shaving $20 million off the budget. And you wouldn't know that unless I just told you or you read it before because the movie flows so well at being pure controlled chaos which is Deadpool. This movie also makes a character that doesn't work all the time in comics work through every single beat. If there's one thing you'll learn from both Deadpool comics and a lot of Deadpool fans is that when in the wrong hands, there's nothing more annoying than Deadpool. 
But when in the right hands, you realize that Deadpool is a character that wears a mask not to hide his identity, but to protect you from seeing his gross face. He is an exposed nerve as a character. He is the ultimate in using comedy as a defense mechanism. And this movie uses comedy as a defense mechanism. This is a movie that is about love. This is a movie that's about loss. This is a movie about cancer. This is 50-50 meets The Notebook with pegging. This movie is able to do everything Deadpool doesn't just want to do. It's everything Deadpool needed to do to legitimize him as the character that he needed to be. And this movie is so good it actually changed the comic books. This movie is when every single person loves the art they're making and every single frame shows for it. Number four, another lot of comments coming for this one. I'm ready for y'all. Bring them on. The Dark Knight. This is not a Joker movie comments 7 through 52. This is a Batman movie with the Joker in it. Yes, the Joker is a very important character. Yes, I think the Joker is the best acting I've ever seen, including Brando, including Pacino, including whatever other Scorsese actor you want to throw at me. The Joker is a character that's able to surprise himself in line delivery and give us an audience an experience we hadn't seen before in acting. But that only works because of the other side, which is Batman. Batman is about doing the right thing and accepting escalation. The last frame of Batman Begins is things are going to get worse. The Dark Knight works because things got worse and we didn't lose Batman. The movie The Dark Knight is about two white knights. One has to go dark. Aaron Eckhart gets no love when it comes to this movie because everyone's so busy talking about Heath Ledger as they should. But Aaron Eckhart is able to show you what absolute power corrupts absolutely or what corruption when seen and facing it to such a level can do to a person. This is a movie about love. This is a movie about corruption. This is a movie about politics. This is a movie about what it means to be human that has jaws running around in it, the chaos element that is the Joker. Heath Ledger has something like 17 minutes of screen time. Yes, there's some of the best 17 minutes ever put to film. Heath Ledger's the reason I do this. I want to be an actor because of Heath Ledger. That led me to this job. I'm saying nothing disparaging between Heath Ledger. What bothers me is every single person that talks about The Dark Knight decides that it's a Joker movie and lets everything else go. Even if this was a Joker movie, it'd be number four. But you need to rewatch that movie without all of these expectations, without all of the 20 years of us getting more and more cynical and appreciate the fact that Christopher Nolan ignored everything that had came before, let the foundation of Batman Begins be what he launched off on and made one of the most masterful pieces of film, not even in the comic book genre we've ever seen, that has some of the best performances we will ever get. And it's about what it means to have hope. I hate the disrespect for the Dark Knight. Put some respect on it, number four. Number three is a big old surprise for me. Not in the list, I made this list, in my experience of it. When they announced Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, I was so confused. Because for me, the Spider-Verse story was a really fun way to introduce new characters. And why would you go, hey, let's skip a Miles Morales story and bring in a ton of new characters. And I was worried for Miles Morales. I was like, man, we got Peter Parker. They should have like someone like Andrew Garfield be a mentor to Miles Morales. They're going to bring him in an animation. I was just worried about everything. Then they announced it was Lord and Miller. And I was like, okay, I will no longer go into this with any expectations except for I'm going to love its humor. And then it gave me a movie that was able to not only explain quantum theory to kids, it's so witty, but it also gave me six of my favorite spider people. This movie is able to do what I think most other team movies try and fail at. I love when a movie can go, hey, we're gonna bring in all of these characters, much like Guardians of the Galaxy, and you're gonna care about all of them. Do you know how much I cared about Spider-Man Noir before Into the Spider-Verse? Not so much. I'm the biggest Spider-Man fan I know, and this movie gave me so many characters I love. This movie gave me a Sinister Six, effectively. This movie gave me multiversal twists and turns on characters I love like Doc Ock with one of the best voice casts you could ever hope for. And it reminded me what it means to be Spider-Man. We hadn't had that direct of a path of what it means to be Spider-Man in so long. There was a void of what Spider-Man was in the pop culture zeitgeist. He wasn't the number one spot like Spider-Man often is. And it gave us a new twist on with great power comes great responsibility. It gave us a whole new motto. Anyone can wear the mask is now just as synonymous to me as Spider-Man. That's from this movie. A movie I didn't know would land gave me a new take on my favorite comic book character. This movie 
is perfect in every frame. It didn't just change animation, it changed Spider-Man. Number two is for Greg and Greg only. Greg, you can edit this out because it's just for you. They're going to go 3 1. That's weird. Captain America Winter Soldier, number two. You heard it here first. Uh huh. Do you, Greg? It's not what I hear with your hot take videos. Oh, is it overrated? My number two. Is my number two? Is my number two comic book movie overrated, Greg? I'm sorry to interrupt. Do your thing. Well, let me get back to it, audience. This is a movie with multiple villains that all are legitimized in their journey. Even Arnim Zola, which is a character that shouldn't work, it makes sense where he's coming from, and that's insane. This is a movie with, I think, the best action in the MCU next to Daredevil on Netflix, which if we included TV shows, this would be an eight hour video because Daredevil on Netflix. This is the best cinematic action, I think, hard stop. Between the knife fight, the elevator, everything else, this is a movie about distrust. You've got a character, Captain America, that literally represents being spangled, being a badge, being something that represents trust and the opening of the movie, he's in a different suit, which lays the groundwork for not trusting the systems. If there's one thing I've learned is in life, I'm not serious. One of the biggest things I've ever learned is adulthood doesn't happen. It's the moment you realize there is no adulthood. We're all just figuring it out. My biggest piece of adulthood has been learning the systems that we believe in aren't actually there always to help us. So you can't just blindly trust these systems. This is a movie about that starring a character that often is written so poorly he represents all the blind patriotism that gets us in trouble. This movie subverts not just movie norms, but life norms, and does it with incredible action, incredible villains, and it reestablishes the entire MCU by dismantling the only system we knew within the MCU, S.H.I.E.L.D. It makes us distrust everything we've ever seen. This movie, much like Logan being a launching point in a maturation, much like Iron Man 3 being about trauma that grows us up, this movie is about what it is to be an adult. Do not trust anything at face value. Do not believe what other people are always telling you. Trust yourself, even if that meant going against everything you thought you believed in. Everything is about your journey and Winter Soldier, especially through the lens of Steve abandoning what he felt was told to him for what he felt was right, while beautifully illustrated through the Winter Soldier himself, through Bucky having to discover what it is to be a person, having to put his life back together, having to have two characters from opposing sides reprogram themselves as brothers. This movie is better than, for me, any Captain America comic, and this movie is, for me, what it means to be an adult. Hopefully you guys got to see what I thought of Cap. All right, so I've got some honorable mentions before we get to number one. These are videos I would also love to do, tell Greg. My first one is Batman Returns. I think Batman Returns is very important in the early days of comic book movies, in being a bold trendsetter and being a foundational bit of all of this. I just personally don't rewatch it as often, so it didn't make my top 25, but it's really close. X-Men First Class is a movie that went against the universe they had already built and made an X-Men movie that felt more like an X-Men movie. I feel like X-Men First Class is much closer to the X-Men than the Brian Singer mutant movies we got. Unfortunately, we never got to see that go forward, but I think that movie on its own is way more important than people give it credit for. V for Vendetta is one of the great adaptations of graphic novels in that it is able to translate and adapt the medium very, very accurately. And I feel like this is a graphic novel that is more and more topical every day. And this movie doesn't get brought up enough, but again, it's not something that I feel like I revisit enough to have on the list, but I think it's one of the most important comic book movies. Joker's tricky. It definitely makes my favorites list, but I think it has much like Fight Club and a lot of Wolf of Wall Street fans, the worst fans and PR out there. I think the people that are loudest about Joker don't understand exactly what it's saying, or I could be wrong and they do exactly understand it. I like that Joker is a dangerous movie. I I like that Joker represents when people go too far into their beliefs. This is a movie that actually made me nauseous. This is a movie that upset me watching. This is a movie that made me worry about humanity. And I cannot deny that art is anything that makes you feel. I loved this art. It just worries me that the wrong people love this art so passionately. So I couldn't in good conscience feel like it's a movie about what I think comic books are, which is hope. This is like when you lose hope. And I think that's beautiful for emotions, but I think that's terrifying for humanity. And then we're gonna say a few that I love for good measure. Watchmen, I think, is a very loyal adaptation. I think the twist at the end was needed to make it work in the medium. I think Men in Black is so slept on. It was a Malibu comic, which was then bought by Marvel. So technically, if we have the Secret Wars event, we could have Vincent D'Onofrio fighting Vincent D'Onofrio 
as someone that wants some sugar and water. There's a lot of comic book movies that got us here, but that top 25 is just where I feel like are the important foundational ones and my favorites to revisit. If you want 26 through 50, hit up Greg at greg at greg.gmail.com. No, leave a comment below. Let me know which ones you agree with, which ones you disagree with. Let me give you my number one though. This is, I think, the greatest, favoritist, bestest, comic book movie of all time. I made a fairly impassioned video for my MCU countdown. And yes, we are sticking with the MCU. And if you guys want a more extended version of the answer to this question, my number one is Spider-Man No Way Home. And I am very understanding that this came out in December. It is now September. I am aware that that is nine months. But I haven't stopped thinking about when I started believing in comic book movies as a thing we could get. When I saw there was a Wizard magazine, which is a trade publication about comic books, and there was a, there was a poster that said parody in really small letters on the bottom. Your boy was five, didn't know what the word parody meant, so I literally put this poster up on my wall, thinking we were getting a James Cameron directed Leonardo DiCaprio starring Spider-Man movie because that was a poster, which means it's real. For about two years, I embarrassingly didn't ask anyone what parody meant, and I just stayed hopeful for this movie that never came to my theater. So from like it might have been six, but from like six to eight or thereabouts. I was waiting for a movie that never existed. Spider-Man No Way Home ended up being that movie because it was a movie that didn't just take how I felt about Spider-Man as a kid. It didn't just take other people's favorite Spider-Man. It was the culmination of all of the different Spider-Men in a way that shouldn't have worked. I was saying earlier, Into the Spider-Verse, I thought was a, a way to sell toys and bring in new characters. I was afraid No Way Home would be a way to pat someone on the head that loved Toby, pat someone on the head that loved Andrew Garfield, and launch T Tom Holland. It wasn't. It made Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire our Uncle Ben for our universe. It gave Aunt May the power of the character that she needed to have from the J. Michael Straczynski run. It gave us the Green Goblin we always deserved. It gave us damn near the Sinister Six I never thought we'd had since they were introduced in Spider-Man Annual back in 1964. These are the stories that made me a comic book fan, and they were able to not just put one into a two and a half hour movie, they were able to blend them all using the medium that wouldn't work in comic books. I love No Way Home, because this wouldn't work as a comic. Because you don't have the connection to the drawings of these characters like you do with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland. When you look at Andrew Garfield, not only do you see his Spider-Man, but you think of all the emotions you have with him in interviews if you watch them, with him in other movies if you watch them. The medium of film is more than what's on the screen. It's your emotional connection to everything you're seeing. No Way Home would take volumes of comic books because we've lived with Toby for 20 years. We've lived with Andrew for 10 years. We've lived with Tom for damn near half a decade. All of our emotional connection to all of that, plus how we feel about Spider-Man, all got brought together through incredible technology, through trust in John Watts. And John Watts got to make the Spider-Man movie that he waited six movies to tell the origin for, that he waited to give his flourish and style of directing for, that we earned by being patient. This movie couldn't have existed until this year, and this story couldn't have existed in another medium, and none of this could have existed if we didn't stay passionate about Spider-Man, if we didn't believe in these heroes, and none of this would have worked if we hadn't been such fans of the other 24 movies I listed on the way here. This is, to me, the ultimate butterfly effect to being a comic book movie fan, and it stuck the landing. It is a perfect experience for me, and it's one of the best two and a half hour times I've had in a movie theater, and I can't wait for it to get re-released. I just realized this is practically a commercial for the Spider-Man No Way Home re-release, available September 6th or something. I'm not sure when it comes out, but you know I'll be there. I need those 11 more minutes. This has been very long. If you want to know a little bit more about how I feel about it from the other side, from the comic book side. I do talk about it in the MCU countdown. That video is also on this channel, in this playlist. I could do a couple hours on No Way Home. I have uh, on this channel. This list is every different studio, to me, loving art and loving what we love and why we're here. So any of these 25, any of the honorable mentions, any of the 26 through 50 I didn't get to talk about, it's all out of love. And I think a lot of people get cynical about show business, but it's coming from people that love it as much as you do. Next time you want to talk shit about me, which is going to come because I put your movie at whatever number, know that it's coming from a place of love. I love all this stuff. So I hope you love it too. 
I hope that uh, this list gave you at least some perspective on where I come from so you can be like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way, or oh, I didn't realize this is how you felt. Not a place of me saying that one movie is better than another. This is my experience with this art, and I hope you experience it differently because you had a different life. Leave your list below. I'd love to read which ones you enjoy, how you rank them, what your favorites are, and I will read the comments up until people get shitty. We'll see how long that lasts. But I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for being so welcoming here on my comic corner here at the Reject Nation. Please comment, like, subscribe, all the things I always say too fast. Greg, any notes? No, just, 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 just leave? End, end, end the video. Okay, we should go. End, end it, Bye, guys. Fuck Winter Soldier. <laughs> <laughs>